Thank you very much. It's been incredibly inspiring to listen to all these um, personal stories uh, of where you where we, you came from and where you want to go. Thank you, Julie, for teasing those uh, great stories out of uh, our colleagues. This is a very big room, but what we want to have here is an intimate conversation. We don't, uh, this is not like the traditional, some of the traditional meetings that take place in this room with lots of uh, speeches and uh, long prepared statements. What uh, I want uh, to do this morning uh, is have an inspiring conversation with uh, someone that is extremely inspiring. This is uh, the First Lady of Botswana, Neo Masisi. Big applause for her, please. <laughs> Welcome, Madam First Lady. First Ladies are very important people. And let me just walk you through some of these very important people in the history uh, of uh, humankind. We've got someone like uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who was very much behind uh, the New Deal in the United States, someone that fought very hard for human rights, for women's rights, someone that after leaving um, her functions as First Lady, pushed for the UN Charter of Human Rights. We have in another part of the world, Sonia Gandhi, incredible power figure uh, in Indian politics as head of the Indian National Congress. We have Grasa Michelle, closer home, um, first lady of two countries. More recently, first ladies getting together uh, in the African continent to fight against HIV AIDS. So, First ladies have a lot of power. Only some dare exercise this power. And I want to start uh, with you because I know you like to exercise this power, of course, discreetly, of course, silently, but effectively. I want uh, uh, you to tell us about a campaign and road shows that you started in Botswana. It's called Dipalametse, and it's got as an objective to fight HIV AIDS uh, with uh, the youth. And I want to start there. I don't want to start with trade. I want to start a big higher up uh, because trade doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in a context. And what happens in this context is extremely helpful for how we can uh, use this le lessons, these learnings in trade. Madam, why did you start this? What was your objective uh, when you uh, fought uh, to put together Dipalametse? Good morning. And first of all, I'd like to thank you, Arantxa, and your ITC team for giving me this opportunity of being here. Whenever I speak to people, I know there's a lot to learn because A, I have to give a lot of thought to what I'm going to say, and uh, I know I'm gonna come out better after this conversation. But going back to your question, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about Botswana. This is a country with a population of 2.3 million, and like most countries in the world, most of the population is a young population. 60% of our population is actually made of the young people. And another fact is that Botswana ranks third in terms of HIV AIDS prevalence which is extremely high for that small population. And given that the demographics point to the fact that that 60%, these are the people who are highly likely to contract HIV and then going on to AIDS. So I thought for me, this was extremely important. In addition to that, I was fortunate that uh, UNAIDS appointed me special ambassador mm -hmm. for the empowerment and engagement of young people. There are a number of priorities, priority areas in terms of young people, but I thought HIV would be high. And why Dipalametse? First of all, I think we must know what Dipalametse means. Dipalametse means basically going on a temple or going on an ascent, going higher. And what, what we're saying here is we have tried everything to the point of almost lethargy. There has been radio shows, churches are preaching, we see TV series on HIV AIDS, and I was thinking, how do we make it different? More so that we are targeting this young, 
innovative, energetic, excited population. And I thought face to face would do it. And not only a face, but a face of a woman. You said it right there, madam, in terms of King's suckling. <laughs> we have a similar expression to the point to digress a bit where we give, we attach a big importance on the maternal uncle. When I get married, it's the maternal uncle who does the negotiation or who's the chief negotiator. And we are saying, this is where the child got the milk mm. and, the, and, the, and the nourishment. So there was, they're seeing this face of somebody who can give them milk, if I may call it that, mm. Miss Suckle. Mm. And there was, this person happened to be the first lady. And by the way, in my country, the first lady has all sorts of names from, I suppose, Mrs. President, from the fact that I'm married to the president, mother, Mrs. Globe. These are literal translations. So what happens when Mrs. Globe steps out there? and speaks to the young people. And what's significant also about Deepa Lamets is that I go out there, I've never done so much talking in my life. In a day, I would see three groups of people. At the end of the day, I'm very tired. The first group are the children in the schools, where we are basically speaking about their issues in terms of HIV AIDS, and basically, this is driven around a study called the Youth Risk Behavioral Surveillance Survey done in 2016. I really hit on those issues. Then, later that day, I speak to the community leadership mm -hmm. because these are the people who drive the community. And it's done in a Khotla setting. I don't know if people are familiar with the Khotla. The Khotla is one of the tools or mechanisms that has made Botswana what it is right now or achieve what it is right now. Because it's free talking. You, you sit in there. The president can come in, this lady who provides milk can come in, and you are free to speak. So I'd go to the Khotla, address the community leadership, and in there, we have law enforcement, we have community leadership in terms of the traditional leaders, we have teachers, we have the private sector sitting in there, so it's really multi-sectoral, where it's fed by what we got from the children. That's another thing we found that our children are very informed. They're very, very informed. And in some cases, much more informed than the adults. And also the unique thing is, in the Khotla, you normally discuss serious issues like development, and when there are problems maybe in the village, how do you sort these out? But for the first time, we're discussing SEX. Because in, in our case, that's the major means of infection. So it's, it's very unique in that sense. And then later, we feed it back to the community, where we, we meet the community. And I can say that the, mo the model works very well, because as I said, it enables us to reach out to these three groups. What we do also is we, we involve the spouses of the leadership in terms of the chief. Mm -hmm. When I do the leadership session, the spouse literally sits next to me, because there are two women here who are providing milk. Because also, in my tenure, and by the way, I forgot to mention this. I stepped into these shoes only 18 months ago, hit by an election last month, hit by inauguration on 1st November, and here we are. I think we should congratulate our president. <laughs> and in my tenure, I'm saying, I always say to the ladies, please be first ladies also in your own corners. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be walking around in this room alone. Because for me, it's a role of service. It's much more than my dress or going to dinners with the president. So come on board. So by so doing and grabbing the spouse of the chiefs, I'm saying indeed, come on board, but you can't go with me to the state house. There can only be one first lady who lives with the president. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> uh, this, this model again, we are just saying, enough of the complacency to take you back again. As you know, Botswana's success story in terms of HIV and AIDS, Botswana was the first to roll out free antiretroviral ARV to, to the, 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 the citizens. But we are saying despite that, because they come at a cost, here we are. So in offering that face, we are just saying 
please, come on, we are really, really serious. And then again, listening to the children and hearing their side of the story, it has also given us very valuable insights. They have raised such things such as parenting issues, lack of role models, sexual exploitation, GBV, parents don't talk about sex, but again, we see this economic empowerment also creeping in, mm -hmm. where we are saying, we are seeing serious pockets of poverty. And for me, coming here, when I saw your invitation, for a while I said, uh, here I am, I'm not a trader. Uh, but anyway, I went on and said, it's really just to share the story of Botswana. But also, I'm saying it's gonna be very relevant in what we are doing, because I treat this not as a static program. It, it can always be improved. Mm -hmm. So this economic empowerment and knowing that there are platforms such as She Trades, I'll squeeze it in there somehow. <laughs> well, if I draw the comparison between what you've just described, Botswana as, a, as some sort of SME country, right? Botswana as a young startup-like country. Uh, Botswana having a big challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, and Botswana wanting to go high. It's a bit the story that we've heard this morning, right? The small women entrepreneurs, uh, young uh, in, uh, in their uh, activities, facing very unique challenges, and this need uh, for them to drive high. I like a lot what you just described, because you've not only described what happens in Botswana on HIV AIDS, you've described what happens for many entrepreneurs, especially women entrepreneurs, uh, when they try to be part of the economy. Now, what, is, what lessons can we draw, uh, madam, uh, from your own experience in this, uh, as you said, um, hot laugh? Maybe we need a hot laugh for women entrepreneurs, uh, which is a bit <laughs> what we're trying to do here. Uh, what is your, what's the biggest lesson from, we, the, the from, from the hot laugh that we could use uh, for women entrepreneurs uh, in this room? Okay, first of all, I think at the Kotla, um, much as there's Ereki, there'll be a chief there and the senior dignitaries, the Kotla brings a level playing ground, i.e. for a moment you feel that you are at one level. You still maintain that respect, of course, that there are different levels. So for me, that's one lesson. And I think for women, it's important in the sense that when we step into rooms and they are men, for starters, we should step in and say, I'm starting off from a premise that we are all equal here. Mm -hmm. I should not suppress myself. I should not hold back. I should not be shy about my knowledge. I should not be shy about my intelligence. Women are intelligent, ladies. Please applaud. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, in the Kotla, you are allowed to speak your language. Obviously, coming from Botswana, a lot of people in there would speak Setswana. Mm -hmm. But as you know, being a former protectorate, we speak English also. Mm -hmm. Those who want to show off the Queen's language and their skill at it, you are allowed to speak in the Queen's language. Mm -hmm. So I think also as women, we must always be free to speak our language. <laughs> I look at my own country, and I find that in fora, since most of these policies or programs are expressed in English, like the tongue twister, Madam Ambassador, <laughs> once you go to the village and tell a lady about the A, CFTA, she immediately thinks she must ask questions in English, she must respond in English. So hence the language. People must realize that wherever you are, be free to speak the language that you are most comfortable with. Thirdly also, the Kotla allows us to say anything. A lot of times, I'll take it back to the women we always think twice. What I'm saying, is it intelligent? Are people going to laugh at me? How are they going to take it? Whereas a man who's a fraction of our intelligence is quick to say, I have a comment there. 
and he literally says nothing. Or he will piggyback on the previous woman speaker and just have a little bit of extension and he looks very intelligent. For me, these are the key, the three key that I can think of right now. I think you made a very important point about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, and we know that you're not, you're not an expert on trade or a trade negotiator, but you're making a lot of common sense uh, to us who are a little bit more uh, maybe nerdies uh, on the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, and that is that if we want all operators on the ground to understand the opportunities that the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement offers, we better start using simpler language for what this offers, for what it means, for what it needs, and for how women can be part of this incredible opportunity. So I know it's not easy to say this in this hall that uh, loves acronyms uh, or the halls uh, where ITC sits, that also the UN, that also loves acronyms, but maybe it's a call to uh, all of us to make it simpler. Um, I wanted to come back to um, what do you think from your experience talking to so many women uh, in, uh, across uh, Botswana, across the country, across levels of uh, uh, income uh, about across uh, levels of education. What is it that is holding the women back? What is it that we should be working on? Where is the, the, the element where we should be putting our finger maybe a little bit more decisively? I suppose, first of all, we shouldn't um, overemphasize the WO. Remember it's WO and then men? Let's put aside the WO. I don't know what we're going to call it going forward. <laughs> but I think WO inhibits us a lot. And it's all in the mind. I think we, ha we need a shift in mindsets where we say we can do it, particularly given the support systems around us, both the technical ones, I mean, right now, the SDG5, specifically speaks to gender equality. We have our own Vision 2036 mm -hmm. in Botswana. Mind you, we shouldn't turn it around to Agenda 2063, because <laughs> the AU is 63. And then the, it was just mentioned that this continental free trade agreement itself has provisions, <laughs> particularly given that there are so many provisions around women. Let us climb on them and use them. With, fear, with no fear. Again, I think women, let us not be afraid of sitting at the tables with the men. I know there's that natural, I don't know if I should call it a stage fright, there's that natural stage fright. You sit in, and I think they also intentionally intimidate us sometimes. You step in, and then a few of them cough. <laughs> <coughs> they suddenly dry, get dry coughs. Ignore those dry coughs. Ignore those stern faces, ignore the red ties, just walk in there and don't be afraid. Recently, I was looking at a book that says something like 101 things that stop women from progressing or from getting the corner office. I was amazed, Arantxa. Basic things such as when there's a meeting, the woman wants to take the back seat. You'd find that the seats in front are actually empty. So we are the ones actually who are telling the guys, come forth, we want to follow. Why can't it be the opposite? Guys, sit at the back. Today, we want to be in front. <laughs> and just to run through others, as women, let us say no to poverty. I know sometimes it's because of the poverty cycles that we may have experienced as we were girls, but let us deliberately say no to poverty. It's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And say, a woman, where there's a woman, she can stop poverty. We must stay informed. Let us not be afraid of reading, attending workshops, because as they say, information is power, and we can make informed decisions. As women also, let us be role models for the girls. Mm -hmm. We may have failed at some point. I always say, women my age, not to put you down, but I say, 
we are more or less on the decline. It's the young generation. We heard those youngsters eating insects, stealing pots. They are the generation. They are the true generation. So what we can do now as women, let us be role models for those girls. Let us just bring up very, very powerful women who are not going to be sitting at the back like we did. Yeah, I think... I think you put your finger into one uh, difficulty we all face uh, as, as women, whether it's in, uh, in the economy, whether it's in trade, whether it's in politics, whether it's in the workplace, which is having a bit of a confidence, having the confidence to say, I have a seat at that table. I don't have to beg for it. I don't have to sit on the second or on the third uh, row at the table. I can sit at the first row at the table. And I know that sometimes it's, uh, it's a bit intimidating, but uh, I think this is, a, I like your call for all of us uh, to be conscious that we have that place, but also to tell our uh, sons and our daughters uh, that uh, they also have that place, that they don't have to beg for it. Now, I want, um, I want uh, you to tell us a little bit about who you are and where you came from, uh, because we know you are the uh, first lady of Bot Botswana, but, but you are not just the first lady of Botswana. You come from somewhere. You've been uh, working somewhere before becoming the first lady, and, and I'm sure that in the future you will go somewhere, and I, d I don't want to open that chapter because maybe that's a little bit uh, sensitive, but who is, who is Neil Masisi? What I'll do is I'll not go in any chronology. It's going to be a puzzle, and uh, it's really a test of concentration and attention. <laughs> so I'll start off with the fact that uh, I used to work for the UN, actually in this very city. I lived here for seven years at UNECA. I was working at UNECA. And um, I actually left eight days before inauguration last year. And uh, that's how much I was in denial. And that's how fiercely independent I am. I, <laughs> I didn't want to go home, get in dress cut, and just sitting and waiting for inauguration. So the opportunity that I had, stayed here in Addison, left uh, a week before. That's part of the story. I'll go back. Like a typical African child or African daughter, my journey starts where there were these grandparents rearing cattle. Remember also another significant figure about Botswana is that before Botswana got its independence in 1966, Botswana was one of the top 10 poorest countries in the world. Actually, apparently, when the British left, some of them were laughing. You know, like, they want independence. There's only, was it four kilometers of Tard Road, Ambassador? How much? Six. Six. There were six kilometers of tar road. I don't know how many graduates there were, but you can imagine. Oh, another important factor, there were no diamonds by then. So, you'll see how Botswana was lucky because diamonds were found two years later. So, these grandparents had 11 children. Six girls, five boys. And why do I say that? They decided that education was for all. Education was for all. This was in the late 40s, the 50s, the 60s. One of the children there happened to be my mother. So i just like to share that I'm a direct beneficiary of the wisdom of a typical old man and old woman because they had the wisdom of educating this young girl. I also want to say this young girl was very lucky. She went on to university, and there it all started, my firm belief in education. Mm -hmm. I look back and say, if that girl made it, more so that she had me like in the second year, went back, stayed with my grandparents, and went back to college. So there it is the story. A girl who was allowed to go to school, a girl who was supported, a girl who was given the opportunity and I'd also like to say myself. This woman, again, because she was doing what her parents had done. I was a young girl who was really
continually supported and nurtured. She was very clear, there are six of us. But my mother was very clear that she is a mother, mother hen. <laughs> and there it was, I am here today. But I'd also like to mention the sort of partner or my spouse, sort of spouse that I have. This is a spouse married me two years later, I was allowed to go out and serve in the UN. I was away for 14 years. I've lived in New York, I've lived in Central African Republic, and I've lived in Ethiopia. So the power of just having somebody, that better half indeed, but I think in this case it's the best half. Having this best half, who's able to say, young madam, I have studied abroad, and you are saying that by virtue of the fact that you've lived in Botswana, got married in Botswana, schooled in Botswana, you're not educated. For sure, go out there and do nothing else but fly. Boy, oh boy. Boy, oh boy. Fly, I did. Fly, I did. Little did we know that their creator the greatest, was preparing this woman for this role. Speak of luck, speak of fate, speak of unseen forces. That is basically the sort of story that I'd like to share. But I'd just like to conclude by saying, in summary, when woman believes in herself, and when woman sets her own tone, remember women, has a lot of noise around her. And mind you, it's amazing. Some of the noise comes from other women. <laughs> so whatever the source of noise, but when this woman has set her tone, then she can only keep going and taking others along the path. I've learned that the more women, the more girls that I take along this path, mm. my dear, can I ever lose? No. There's a snowball effect. As I step around also, I've deliberately said, where I go, there has to be a snowball effect. Otherwise, what is my purpose in this world? What am I gonna tell people on the other side of the world? More importantly, Arantia, I'm raising a wonderful little girl. <laughs> and I want her to have much more than I had. The support, this nurturing, this love, this caring, this secure family, I want her to have much more. And I'm saying she's also learning that to pick up another sister, to pick up another woman, that's what gives you true purpose in this life. I'd finally just like to say also, a value system has always guided me. And it was very important for me because I moved out of my country. Wherever I lived, I knew that when I get to New York, I'm still Neo. I'll, st I'll call myself Neo in this instance. I'm Neo. I come with my culture. And that's the nice thing about the UN. Yeah. You are allowed to showcase your culture. One thing that I always, one example I like giving is in New York, I always used to greet people more than once during the day. <laughs> so by 4 p.m. they say, no, but you greeted me twice already. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry. It's part of my culture. <laughs> Just the greeting. And then also, this woman believes in sacrifice. I had to sacrifice a lot. I was sharing just 10 days ago how I cried when I wrote my resignation letter that I'm leaving. By the way, I wrote it after election results. You understand why. <laughs> I was given special leave without pay. Slop. Famous acronym. Slop, yes. I had to write my letter. Slop was over. We had our election results, and they were good. Finally, I'd just like to say, because now I'm first lady now, I'm speaking as first lady now, not just as a woman. I'd just like to share that this role is not easy. I know a lot of people are curious about the role. It's very lonely at times because people think you are some semi-god. I try to tell people I'm as human and normal as possible as anybody else, but they still keep that distance. Please, we're just as human as anybody else. I have a very busy spouse and it's a job where we know we share head of the household, my husband. There's no privacy. Open book all the way. Open book all the way. Social media, not very friendly. But I like someone who said, initially they'll crush you, pull you, and then they love you. I think I'm at a stage where they're just almost loving me. <laughs> Thanks, God. <laughs> and then 
I'd just like to say I keep a very strong support system around me and I'd like to also encourage other women to do that. You cannot do it alone. Call them whatever, your roots, your anchors. Make sure you have those cheer leaders. They'll take you a long way because they have similar experiences and they can relate to you. And then finally, I'd just like to say I learn every day and I'm glad that I'm here with you today. And uh, thank you again. Wow. Hashtag wow. <laughs> Education. As the daughter, the niece, and the sister to teachers, that is the biggest asset that I ever got in my life. Education. Education in values in purpose in life, not just life, not just knowledge, but values to drive you somewhere. Networking, sharing, mentoring, and over and above all of this, this desire to fly. Neil, I'm going to call you by your first name because by now this is it, this is where we are. Neil, thank you very much for your wisdom. Thank you for your words. Thank you for your uh, own personal story that I am sure it will inspire our colleagues and the thousands watching us uh, live on Facebook as it has inspired me. Thank you very much for being with us. And ladies and gentlemen, please out there to fly high. Thank you very much and a big applause uh, to Neil Masisi. Thank you.